right, happy Sabbath, everybody. <laughs> it's wonderful that all of you have joined us here. I know that uh, <clears throat> we've been having some technical difficulties and things like that, uh, as usual. <laughs> but today, uh, we're going to continue our uh, Bible foundations, and this happens to be on communion, actually. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's going to be really short, actually, because we do have to begin our communion uh, service uh, here today. And so um, uh, let's pray again and let's ask the word to, Lord to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your love and many blessings. We ask that you will bless our uh, time here and uh, give me the words uh, to speak that, Lord, we may gain a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So communion. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it. And he gave to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many unto the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I shall not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. All right, so communion. So what is uh, communion? Um, John chapter uh, 3. Uh, oh, well, first of all, uh, when you think about communion, it is a time of renewing uh, and a time of revival. All right? That's what communion is. Communion, we come, we come together as a church uh, once a quarter to have a renewing experience, to have a revival experience, uh, and that is why we come together. So what is this experience, and how, uh, how do we practically do this? Oh, ooh, whoa. Okay, so John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15 if I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. All right, so at this time, what was happening? Jesus was where? In the upper room, In the upper room right? And, they were, and the disciples were doing what? They were bickering. Oh, I'm the greatest. Oh, no. I'm better than you. They were bickering, right? They were fighting among each other. And what did Jesus do? Jesus calmly gets a, a, a pail of water. He comes down, and what does he do? He begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, at that time, that was a humiliating thing to do, right? It was always reserved for the lowest person to do, right? But... Can you imagine the master washing people's feet, right? And so this was unheard of. Now, this caused several things to happen. What happened? First of all, everyone was what? Quieted down, right? And what did Peter, impetuous Peter, do? He said, don't wash. <laughs> don't wash my feet, master. What are you doing, right? So several things happened into, in the hearts of the disciples. Number one, self-examination. Why is Jesus doing this? What's going on here? What's happening? Number two, after realization, when Jesus said, if I then, the Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Confession of sin. Right? They look at each other and they're like, if the master is doing this, why are we fighting? Why are we causing to do this? We must ask for forgiveness. And then thirdly, the reconciling of differences. Did the disciples do that after that? I would say yes. Because after this, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And so those differences began to quiet down. And so... This is the experience. When we wash one another's feet, when we come together, we must first of all, right, have self-examination. Have I lived up to Jesus' example? 
Have I done things that are not right? Have I caused another person to sin? Then confession of sin. Public sins, not private sins. There's a difference, right? Private sins, you confess in your own heart, but public sins. Go to your brother, go to your sister. Confess your public sin. And then what happens after that naturally? You reconcile the differences, right? So those are the three things that happened or happen, or that's the experience that we must have. Self-examination, confession of sin, and the reconciling of differences. All right? And then the second part here. All right, Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it. And he gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Right? So, and John 6, 51 tells us, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And so what does it mean to eat of Jesus' body? I know we hear this all the time. This is a concept, a biblical concept that we think about all the time, that we hear all the time. Eat Jesus' body. What does it mean? Well, physically, medically, if you eat something, what happens to it? It becomes a part of of you, right? So if you eat the wrong things, that becomes a part of you. Proteins change in your cells, and eventually you are more prone to things like diabetes, cancer, right? Heart disease, things like that. If you eat the proper foods, what happens? You feed your body with the proper things, right? And so Jesus said, eat me. And so it means to take Jesus, as we would our own food, and Jesus literally must become a part of us, okay? Now, what does that mean? Oh, you know, we must accept Jesus. We must accept Jesus. What does that mean, right? Because it's, it's kind of an abstract concept, right? So what it means, and, and this will be a little more, this will be kind of abstract too, it is taking his character, his life, his thoughts, and making them our own. So what does that mean? It means taking his character, his life, his thoughts, and making them our own. How do you do that? How do you make something your own? I remember when I was a youth pastor, and uh, we talked about music and lifestyle. (laughs) And they said, oh, Pastor Ray, this doesn't affect me. This doesn't affect me at all. You know, when we're talking about music, And I said, oh, well, how come you're dressed with your jeans showing your underwear? How come your clothes is baggy? And how come you talk like, hey, yo, what's up, yo? Where did you get that from? Did your parents teach you that? Does your parents talk like that? Did your parents dress like that with their pants half half down, hanging out? Where did you get that from? From the world, right? You're taking the world's character, the world's thoughts, and you're making them your your own, right? And so all these things, when you you whatever things are in this world, you take it and it becomes a part of you. And so what happens? Where does it reflect? It reflects on the outside. Whatever is in the heart reflects on the outside. And so what Jesus is saying is, take my body. In other words, take me into your heart. Take my character. Take my life. Take my thoughts. Back in the day, I used to listen to CNC Music Factory. I'm dating myself now. (laughs) Way back in the day, I had that car with the big woofers. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, you know, I had the jeans. I had all that stuff. I look completely different than I do today, right? Why? Why was that? Because I had taken the character, the life, the thoughts of the world. I thought like the world. I acted like the world. I dressed like the world. But when God called me to be a pastor, what happened? It changed. I used to have such a foul mouth. I used to cuss all the time. I used to have a temper, bad temper. 
terrible temper. In fact, I believe that's why my sister is not in the church, because of my temper, because of my sin. But what happened when Jesus took over? Changed my life because I ate Jesus. I drank Jesus. I thought of Jesus. And he gave me patience. He took away my anger. He took away my foul mouth. He changed my dress. Now I no longer walk around with my underwear hanging half, half out of my pants. <laughs> And I don't talk like, hey, yo, what's up, yo? And I don't cuss every half word out of my mouth. Why? Because Jesus transforms us. And this is what communion is representing. When Jesus says, take my body, do that. And guess what he does? He will remove all those things in this world. And guess what will happen? It will remove anxiety, depression. It will remove all these things. And notice why now. Why is the bread unleavened? Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Do you know, not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Little bit of worldliness leavens our whole mind and body. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And so Jesus says, we, or Paul says, we must become a new lump. Right? New lump. That's interesting language. All right? New lump of dough. <laughs> All right? That the master can fashion. All right? So, um, reading on there. Therefore, let us keep the feast, no with, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and sickness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. All right? So, what happens? When we eat the unleavened bread of life, when we eat Jesus into our hearts, what happens? It begins to unleaven us, right? It begins to clean us out. Because why? Jesus said that he came to save us from our sins, not in our sins. And so he transforms our life and our body. So to review, eating the bread symbolizes us taking on the character of Christ, taking the life of Christ, taking the thoughts of Christ, and making his life our own. Rather than taking someone else that we look up, look up into the world or the culture that is in our countries or wherever we are, it's not about that. We take the culture of heaven. We take the culture of Christ, and we put it where? into our hearts and into our minds. And thirdly, and we're going to be closing with this, the wine and the grape juice. Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28. And he took a cup and gave thanks and gave to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many unto remissions of sins. Now, what does remission mean? In Oxford Dictionary, it means cancellation of a debt, a charge, or a penalty, right? That's what it means. Okay, so when you have a remission, and when we talk about in the medical field, we talk about cancer in remission, that literally means that cancer is what? Gone, gone right? It's gone. It's, it's disappeared, right? That's the same thing. What does Jesus say? He will do what? He will do remit our sin. And first of all, what is the blood there for? The blood is a what? Blood of the covenant, right? Now, why does Jesus have to make a blood of the covenant? Was there an old and new covenant? What was the old covenant? It was back in Moses' time, right? During that time, when they were uh, gathered there, in front of uh, Mount Sinai, and Moses gave the Ten Commandments. He gave the uh, laws of, of Israel, both uh, the, the, the normal laws, right? Their basic living, hygiene, all that stuff, plus uh, judiciary law, plus the sanctuary laws, right? He gave all that. And then God said, if you do, those, do these things, I will do what? I'll make you a great nation, Right? But what happened to Israel after that? When we read our Bibles, they. 
That's right. <laughs> they said, all that the Lord we will do. And then what happened? They, they cut the, the they, they shed blood, right? They had a sacrifice and they shed blood. But then what happened? And right after that, they worshiped the golden calf and they broke the covenant. So notice what happened during that covenant time, right? They said, all that the Lord has said, we will do, right? We will do, okay? But uh, what happened after that? God kept working on them. God kept working. You look at the kings. You go through all the kings. God kept working, but they kept falling. They kept falling. And then finally, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, but he said this, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Jehovah. I will put my law. Now, notice the covenant has changed now. I will put my law in their inward parts or in their hearts, and in their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the new covenant is what? Now it's not dependent on people, right? Now it's dependent on God, right? Jesus, right? So this is a covenant. Jesus said, I'm going to make in those days. What? After those days. What? After which days? Israel. So after Israel, says Jehovah, I will put my laws where? In their inward parts. So what happens, right? So when was that new covenant ratified? At the cross. At the cross. Jesus had to die. God has to die. Right before that new covenant can be ratified, right? And so, and in fact, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 to 18 tells us, For where a testament is, therefore a necessity of a death of him that made it, right? You must die, right? For a testament or a covenant is of no force, you know, unless there is a what? A death, right? So God makes this promise way back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, I'll make a new covenant, after those days, right? And then we have to look and see when that will be ratified. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us that the Messiah will come and he will be hated of all people. He will not be good looking. He'll, he will be not, not, uh, not popular. And he will do what? They will kill him. Right? They will kill him. Isaiah chapter 53. Right? So, what was that? When did that happen? When Jesus died on the cross. When he died. And that's why Jesus said, this is the blood of my covenant. Which covenant is he talking about? He's not talking about the Moses covenant, right? That was already, blood was already shed for that. Which covenant? Isaiah chapter 31, verse 33. Oh, sorry, Jeremiah. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Had a late night last night. All right. So, that's right, Jeremiah 31, 33. Jesus ratified that covenant, right? Now let me ask you this. We're told by our Sunday brethren that Sunday is the symbol of the new covenant. And that's why we keep Sunday. Is that true? What did Jesus say, first of all? This is the blood of my covenant, right? What is the symbol of the new covenant? It is communion service, right? Communion service is a symbol of new covenant. Secondly, Galatians 3.15 tells us that when a covenant is made, you can't add or take away from it, right? When did Jesus say we need to keep Sunday before he died? Never. <laughs> did he ever say that? Never. Never. Right? The new covenant was ratified before there was any Sunday or whatever change that people say they're supposed to be. Sabbath was still Sabbath. <laughs> it was not Sunday. So can Sunday worship be part of the new covenant? It is not. Why? Because when Jesus died, if, if he wanted to add that, anything that had to be added to the new covenant had to be added before he dies. Before his blood was shed. That's why. Sunday can never be part of the new covenant. Amen. So therefore, wine, it represents the promise. Okay, the blood of Jesus represents a promise that God has, first of all, forgiven our sins. 
Number two, the promise is that if we eat the bread of life, he will cause us to live like Jesus, think like Jesus, talk like Jesus, to be free of sin, right? It is the covenant. It is the promise. It is his will. It is his testament. And it is a promise that he will one day take us home with him to heaven. Amen? Amen? What do we do? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever does what? Believes. Believes. That's the only thing we do. Because in the Old Testament they said, all that the Lord will do, we will do. But God said, that didn't work. That didn't work. So what I, what I have to do? I have to make a new covenant. This time, I'm going to supply the power. I'm going to supply the creative work. I'm going to supply everything. All you have to do is choose. When temptation comes up, when someone cuts me off in the road, right? I can choose to be angry. Sometimes I fall. <laughs> or I can choose to say, Jesus, I want your thoughts, your mind. Amen. When I'm in the shopping mall and I hear that music that I used to listen to, I can choose to tap. <laughs> I can say, Lord, I gave that up. Give me the power to have your thoughts, Amen. your mind, to live and breathe like you. This is what communion is about. It is the symbol of the new covenant. Number two, it is not a time of sorrow. It is a time of rejoicing. Because number one, it reminds us that Jesus is coming soon. And number two, the promise is that Jesus will not break bread or drink grape juice until he comes again. What do you want, church? Do you want Jesus? Do you want him in your life? Do you want to have that communion experience? Bow your heads with me if you want that experience, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that you have made a new covenant with us, that because of our weakness, we have no power as the old covenant, as Paul said, for the old covenant, to keep that old covenant. But Lord, now that Jesus has come, now the Messiah has come to take away our sins, all we must do is believe and make a choice for Jesus. And you will supply the power for the new covenant. You see all my brothers and sisters here with their heads bowed. Lord, they want to renew that covenant with you. And as we go through the ordinances, as Jesus has commanded us, we pray that we will keep you in our hearts and in our minds. And let us not go away from this Sabbath the same person, but let us go away a different person, a person like Jesus. In all this we ask and thank you for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.